Our uh, next topic is ST elevation myocardial infarction, STEMI, need to reperfuse from my colleague Sanjay uh, Kunapali. Uh, Sanjay heads the cardiology division at Willowbrook, Houston Methodist, and his great colleague, certainly that's his bread and butter, daily STEMI. Uh, good to have you, Sanjay. So we're going to be talking about the ST elevation myocardial infarction and need to reperfuse. So the short and long answer is yes, we need to reperfuse. <laughs> so a little bit about coronary syndromes. It's a spectrum as coronary disease with stable angina, unstable angina, non-STEMI, and STEMI. If you look at the pathophysiology of it, it's relatively the same pathophysiology but a continuation, a plaque rupture which causes aggregation of platelets, and when an epicardial coronary artery completely occludes, you get an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Why do we need to reperfuse? This slide says it all. Time is muscle, and uh, the quicker we reperfuse, we can save the heart muscle. The longer we do not reperfuse, the heart muscle dies. Most cases of acute myocardial infarction, again, are caused by plaque rupture when you have a complete occlusion and cessation of blood flow in an epicardial coronary artery, you get a STEMI. STEMI patients should either be reperfused by fibrinolytics or by PCI. Within the first 12 hours is where the most benefit is achieved. So fibrinolytic therapy versus PCI, these are the two options that we have. In all cases, primary PCI is the preferred choice if we have a ER, a hospital, and an operator. However, there are still many places in the country where PCI may not be available, in which case we need to know about fibrinolytics. Going into detail about fibrinolytic therapy, fibrinolytic therapy establishes flow in about 75% of the patients when given in an appropriate time. Looking back at some of the historical perspectives, in 1933, Tillett and Garner first described the activity of fibrinolytic therapy and beta hemolytic strep. They had a patient with pleural fusion, and they gave fibrinolytics and published this paper and how they broke down the exudative pleural fusion in these patients. They are plasminogen activators, serine proteases that participate in the lysis of fibrin by converting plasminogen to plasmin. So this little gra uh, pictorial here depicts different places where different fibrinolytics act, and we'll go over them briefly here. You have fibrin-specific agents, such as TPA, single-chain urokinase plasminogen activators, tenecteplase, rataplase, uh, staphylokinase, montoplase, pelotoplase, and amidoplase. Then you have rataplase and lantoplase, which are in intermediate fibrin-specific, and you have nonspecific fibrin agents, such as urokinase and streptokinase. The granddaddy of them all, well, the first one was streptokinase. It's a single-chain polypeptide. It was derived from beta hemolytic strep. It binds to plasminogen, it forms a complex, becoming an active enzyme that cleaves peptide bonds on other plasminogens. High doses are needed. This is one of the issues with it. And when you give it, you give 1.5 million units over 60 minutes, and the patients need to get 325 of aspirin. The problem is antigenicity and allergic reactions to anti-streptococcal antibodies on a subsequent repeat encounter with streptokinase. So allergic reactions, hypotension, and bleeding have been the issue with giving streptokinase. Then came alteplase, recombinant tissue TPA. It's naturally occurring. It's a serine protease. It's produced by a number of tissues, including endothelial cells. In contrast to streptokinase, it's very fibrin-specific, and it's fibrin-bound, so that it just binds to the plasminogen. TPA is a poor enzyme 
if there's no fibrin, but when fibrin's there, it enhances the activation and, and rate of plasminogen. It has a short life, about three to four minutes, roughly about three and a half minutes, and the fibrinogen depletion it can, uh, compared to streptokinase, ultimately results in less fibrinogen depletion. IV heparin is always required when you give alteplase. You see alteplase given concomitantly and you keep the ACTs more than 170 in such patients. Retoplase. Retoplase is a recombinant plasminogen activator, RPA. It's non-glycosylated. It's got a Kringle 2 and a protease domains on TPA, but it lacks the Kringle 1. Retoplase is less fibrin specific and has a longer half-life. So we don't use retoplase that often in pra uh, practice. Tenectoplase is genetically engineered. It's a multi-point mutant uh, recombinant tissue PA. It also is 14 times more specific and has a 80 time, 80 fold higher resistance of to inhibition by plasminogen activator PA1 than standard PP, TPA. And finally, you have lantoplase. It's a deletion and point mutation recombinant TPA. And it's very rarely used because of the increased risk of strokes. Now, going into primary PCI. Primary PCI is defined as coronary angioplasty and stenting, POBA or PTCA with stenting without giving fibrinolytic agents or 2B3A inhibitors. So that is what primary PCI is defined as. It's the reperfusion of choice for all STEMIs. It achieves a very high success rate, most of the times actually 100%, but greater than 90% is the published data. Greater, uh, there's decreased risk of bleeding and stroke, and overall improved outcomes. If primary PCI can be delivered within the first 120 minutes of medical contact, that is the choice of reperfusion. The door to balloon time, which is our gold standard, is 90 minutes. So you get the greatest benefit if you can get a patient opened up within 90 minutes. Most centers and most Methodist centers have about 60, if not 50, and I think we are one of the uh, shortest times in the country. Looking at some data, PCI versus fibrinolytic uh, therapy trials, out of the 23 trials, the risk of short-term death was lower with primary PCI than giving fibrinolysis. Most of this, uh, the gains are from decreased bleeding, decreased hemorrhagic bleeding, and uh, secondary side effects. If you look at trials of PCI, PTCA versus fibrinolysis, P PCI, which is PTCA with stents with fibrinolysis, or PCI versus POBA, most of the trials show that PCI wins a lower rate of stroke, a decreased risk of mortality and reinfarction when patients get stents versus just fibrinolytic agents. You look at the PAMI trial, which assigned about 400 patients that had acute MI to either PCI with balloon angioplasty versus IV recombinant TPA. The main thing that we found was benefits for primary PCI were much higher especially in all age groups, even in age groups that are greater than 70. Now, this, was, this trial was done a significantly long time ago. Now, the most recent data show that even nonagenarians benefit from early revascularization. The same thing, primary PCI with stenting versus primary PCI with POBA, the Denami, PROG, Air, POMI, STAT, and other trials have demonstrated that PCI with stenting has a higher success rate than just fibrinolytics alone. So, STEMI patient comes in, how do you choose? Some of the concepts we need to know, door to needle time, from the time the patient comes in through the emergency room door to the time that they get TPA, or when they come in and they're taken to the cath lab and you get a wire across and inflate a balloon, door to balloon time, and one of the things that we get dinged on is a PCI-related delay, door to balloon minus door to needle time. If you look at a graph, the earlier you reperfuse, the greater the benefit. The longer you wait, the higher the mortality. As you 
as, the, as you look at this graph, the time to thrombolysis and 35-day mortality increases if there is a significant delay. What affects uh, reperfusion? Difference between door to balloon and door to needle time, patient-related factors, patient don't meet criteria for reperfusion. These are all several factors that cause delayed reperfusion. Patient-related factors, age of the patient, duration of the symptoms, location of the MI, risk status, and contraindication of fibrinolytics. These are all things that you need to consider in the emergency room when considering how to reperfuse these patients. This slide is relatively important because they always ask the question, who is a candidate for reperfusion via fibrinolytics? These are the absolute contraindications. Anyone that has had a bleed, anyone that has had a CVA within the last three months, except for within the first three hours, then they can get TPA. Anyone that has an AV malformation, aortic dissection, active bleeding, except for menstrual bleeding, and head trauma within the last three months. These are all the absolute contraindications. The relative ones, anyone that has a blood pressure greater than 180 over 110, if you can get the blood pressure down, and if the benefit is greater than risk, you can use uh, the fibrinolytics. Pa patients with dementia, patients that have CPR greater than 10 minutes, major surgery in the last three months, pregnant patients, patients that are on other anticoagulants. These are all relative contraindications. And then the other main one is prior exposure to streptokinase. No current role for facilitator PCI, meaning patients that receive fibrinolytic therapy and then get transferred. There is very little benefit of opening these arteries. How often is cabbage done for patients that come in with STEMI? Relatively few and far between in the acute setting and few only if the patients do not achieve complete revascularization either by PCI or if they have ongoing chest pain, multivessel disease with cardiogenic shock. Because most of the time within the first 24 to 48 hours of presentation with a STEMI, if they have cardiogenic shock, their, their outcomes are relatively poor if they go to cabbage immediately. Again, who gets cabbage for STEMI? If it's a complicated PCI, mechanical complications in acute MI, such as a rupture, late presentation, or cardiogenic shock. In summary, patients that present with STEMI need to get reperfused. Reperfusion is either by fibrinolytics or by PCI. PCI is the choice of reperfusion if there's an operator and if there is a center. If the patients present within the first 120 minutes, these patients need to get either one of these two. Thank you.